So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our parallel event, Digital Empowerment Reflections on the Role of Women and Girls in Shaping the Use and Development of Technology. My name is Andrea Salguero. I'm the Director of the Office of Public Affairs of the Baha'i Community of Canada, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. And before we begin, I would like to thank the Baha'i International Community, Safira and her team, for partnering on this event and for offering this beautiful space this afternoon. And I would also like to thank our four panelists that have agreed to participate today and have prepared remarks. Two are here in person and two will be participating through Zoom as this is a hybrid event. I'd also like to thank uh, Minister Councillor Beatrice Maillet from Canada's permanent mission uh, to the United Nations for providing today's opening remarks. And for those of you who may be joining online from different places, this event is one of many happening at this year's Commission on the Status of Women. And this year we were all invited to reflect on the priority theme, and I quote, innovation and technological change and education in the digital age for achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. So in response to this theme, this panel is focusing on this concept of digital empowerment. So what does it mean for women and girls to be empowered users of technology? And even going beyond that, what does it mean for women and girls to be actively shaping the use and development of that same technology? Panelists today were invited to reflect on the qualities and capacities that characterize an empowered user of technology and also to consider what it means for a community to be empowered in a way that it can make intentional choices about the adoption of different technologies uh, and those that are conducive to enhancing human flourishing. So I'm very excited that all of you are here today. I think it's going to be a great event and we're going to aim to keep this, the panel discussion to one hour. And after, um, after hearing from each panelist, we're going to have a facilitated discussion where you'll be able to ask questions. And the way we thought we would do it today to accommodate the hybrid format is you have a little paper in front of you for those in the room. If you have a question, you can write it on the piece of paper and signal to uh, either Safira or someone else in the room who will come pick it up and pass it to me. And for those on Zoom, you can write your questions in the chat and someone will also be checking uh, the questions to pass them along. After the presentation, for those that are here in person, we invite you to stay for some light refreshments and to continue the conversation with your peers. So I will now open the floor to Beatrice Maillet for opening remarks. Beatrice Maillet is Minister Counselor and Legal Advisor at the Permanent Mission of Canada to the UN. Ms. Maillet recently served as Senior Legal and Team Leader on UN Reforms budget and legal affairs in the office of the president of the 74th session of the United Nations General Assembly. Previously as a career diplomat, Ms. Maillet served as a director general, legal affairs and deputy legal advisor at Global Affairs Canada. She held other senior positions, including executive director, criminal security and diplomatic law and director general, consular policy bureau. Ms. Maé served at the Permanent Mission of Canada to the United Nations, New York, the Embassy of Canada to the United States, Washington, D.C., as well as the Embassy of Canada to the Kingdom of Belgium, with accreditation to Luxembourg, Brussels. She also served as the Deputy Permanent Observer to the Council of Europe and Strasbourg. Ms. Maé holds a Master's from the Elliott School of International Affairs of George Washington University, a maîtrise in international law from ex Marseille 3, as well as law degrees from McGill University. She was a successful litigation attorney at the firm Robinson Shepard Shapiro in Montreal, Quebec, before she joined the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. So thank you very much for being here today. Look forward to your remarks. Merci beaucoup, Andrea. Thanks so much, Andrea, for welcoming me. I'm very, very pleased to be here with all of you uh, and certainly want to uh, welcome you to this event on my behalf as well as on behalf of the Permanent Mission of Canada to the United Nations. Isn't it good to be back in person mm -hmm. after COVID? Uh, it's certainly 
feels like that in the street around the United Nations, but also in the basement of the UN. We can feel the energy um, that we had lost a little bit over the last uh, three years. It was in the office of the President of the General Assembly when we had to make the very difficult decision to cancel as a first meeting uh, the Commission on Status of Women, especially since it was the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action. And so it's really good to be back. And it's good to be back because it means that together we can really discuss these important issues and strategize how we can advocate for the voice of women and girls in this important theme, especially now as we are looking forward with um, the um, Summit of the Future coming up and the uh, Global Digital Compact to be uh, discussed. And so it's really an important opportunity for us to make sure that the voice of women and girls is considered into this important space. Uh, we strongly believe to work with civil society. And so it's a pleasure for me to really be um, at this table without the voice, without all your voices. Um, we would not have all the tools that we need to make sure that the international community speaks with uh, a strong voice in the realm of digital access, innovation, and education. I really would like to thank the organizer today. It's really a pleasure for us to work with the Baha'i community of Canada, but also with the Baha'i international community, with whom we have a really good working, <coughs> ongoing working relationship. I um, want to uh, really thank you for bringing this panel uh, and highlighted some Canadian expertise that we will have as part of the, uh, of the exchange. And I certainly look forward to hear from, my, uh, from, from the panelists, but also from my fellow Canadians. Um, we are talking about digital empowerment. I'm just, I was a few minutes late because our minister, Minister Ian, uh, was talking actually in the GA all about this uh, space. And certainly it resonated very much for us as this year, Canada is trying to advance at the commission the following elements, promoting human rights and digital inclusion of all women and girls and taking an intersectional approach she was talking to us this morning, how it is uh, being a racialized woman in politics, <coughs> former journalist, how all of these different profiles brought a very much different uh, space for her. Preventing and responding to technology facilitated sexual and gender-based violence is also very important. You know that we are in the midst of a negotiation on a, on a new instrument of cyber crime, and certainly it's an important space. Third, advancing inclusive access to technology and <coughs> learning and quality education. You know, in the post COVID era, we realized how important it was to be able to access education in those uh, times through technologically enabled learning. Uh, and finally, I would say championing women and girls' civic participation, leadership, and decision making, innovation, and economic empowerment in the digital age. So many times this week, I heard we need more women in this space. And that was a strong statement that came also earlier this um, last month in February during the International Day of Women and Girls in STEM. Get more in science. Um, yesterday, I, I really was thinking about the theme of this morning, and I, I maybe some of you have seen the tweet uh, that our governor general has posted yesterday. If you haven't had a chance, I really encourage you to do. The Right Honorable Mary Simmon published in her tweet account um, a startling message to for International Women's Day. It was very powerful because what she posted actually is very extremely difficult to read. And I wanna give you a warning if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. But she basically put a sample of the tweet message that she's receiving. <coughs> and it's a very a small sample of the hateful, misogynistic, racist, and violent communication that she is currently receiving as governor general. Online through social media, 
And it was, uh, it was really, I had to breathe, you know, when I, I read it, like it's, it was really startling. And she wrote, I cannot and will not just brush off or ignore comments or other offer a platform for the spreading of the stereotypes and tropes that I have spent a life opposing. I want to stand beside the younger generation and others who will no longer accept online abuse as routine or as an obstacle to leadership and who are actively working to ensure our conversations reflect the diversity of Canada. I hope that it's a testament how women and girls from different communities all across the world can empower themselves to really be a game changer in this space. So let's have a good time. Thank you. Thank you so much for those opening remarks. I now want to invite Megan to share her remarks. Megan Anderson is a gender and safeguarding manager at Digital Opportunity Trust. Megan works closely with her counterparts across the DOT network to strengthen DOT's growing focus on gender equality and women's empowerment. Megan is responsible for coordinating the development and implementation of project gender equality strategies and implementation plans, strengthening capacity and gender equality across the DOT network, and supporting the mainstreaming of gender into proposals, programs, operations, and budgets. Megan also serves as a safeguarding focal point at DOT HQ. Megan's background in gender equality and women's economic empowerment is grounded in her experience supporting grassroots efforts among women's rights organizations working to support survivors of gender-based violence and improve the resilience of the refugee and migrant communities at the Myanmar Thailand border. She is passionate about community-driven and youth-led solutions that highlight and strengthen the transformative leadership of I also want to mention that Megan is part of Canada's delegation to CSW this year. She is one of 15 delegates that were selected from civil society organizations to be here at CSW. And we're just so happy. Thank you so much for, um, for that amazing introduction. Um, and thank you, Trisha, thank you so much for those opening remarks. Um, yeah, lots to think about, to reflect on in terms of, of that impact of receiving that kind of messaging as women. Um, so yes, I'm so pleased to be here with you all today. Um, uh, as, as Andrea mentioned, I work with an organization called Digital Opportunity Trust. So we are headquartered in Canada, but we have offices in um, Africa and the MENA region. And we work with youth 18 to 35 um, across all of those contexts. Um, and uh, yeah, really our focus in our work with youth is to um, inspire and equip them with digital literacy, uh, 21st century skills, the kinds of soft skills and confidence um, and support that they need in order to access opportunities and thrive in the digital economy. So, um, we're currently implementing a four year project in partnership with Global Affairs Canada that's called Daring to Shift or D2S. Um, and that project is equipping thousands of youth with, um, sorry, tens of thousands of youth, actually, I'm underselling it, uh, with digital jobs for, um, with digital skills for jobs and for entrepreneurship. So our goal is to really try to support youth who have amazing ambition and um, energy and enthusiasm to access um, <coughs> roles in social impact and social entrepreneurship, where they're um, applying those skills and, and that energy to solving huge problems that they see in their, in their <coughs> lives. And I think what's really important about the DOT model to this work is that we really trust youth to be like the leaders of that work. So um, the way we usually operate and, and design and, and create our programs is we co-design with youth um, 
And what that means is we use things like human-centered design and we spend time carrying out workshops where we work with them to develop these projects and design these solutions. Um, and we use a peer-to-peer -peer model. So youth aren't just participants in our projects, they are also um, like implementing those projects with us as facilitators, as leaders. Um, and we find that that model is incredibly impactful because uh, when youth learn from each other, it just creates this like amazing peer network, support network, especially in the context of young women getting into those spaces and building their, their confidence. Um, and so at the heart of all that work we're doing is this idea of the gender digital divide. Um, you know, we know, we've heard all week about the barriers that women are facing. Um, and so the way that we try to target or tackle this is we start by including 70% women across all the programs we run to try and just do like what little we can to address the, the imbalances there. Um, but we know that that's not really enough that, uh, you know, we've, we've also heard about how these spaces are not necessarily safe for young women, about how um, if you look at the pipeline of, of young women moving from education into the workplace in STEM and tech disciplines, you know, their rate of retention not being um, as high. And so we know we need to, um, you know, create these spaces that are going to allow them to feel included, um, that their needs are being meaningfully heard and, and incorporated into how we work. Um, and I would say even beyond that, we also know that We've learned a lot about, about youth and about young women through all of that work I've described. But you know, we are one organization that is in an ecosystem of many different types of organizations and institutions. Um, and many are doing amazing work already as well. And so we know that we need to sort of collaborate with that ecosystem and, and sort of take an ecosystem approach to supporting young women. Um, so once we equip them with that mindset and those skills, they enter into work environments, other learning environments that are going to be safer, more inclusive for them. Um, and so I just wanna describe sort of one way we're doing this right now, um, but happy to elaborate further in the, in the discussion. Um, but right now what we're doing is convening gender equality communities of practice across the different countries we work in. Um, and so they are made up of the youth innovators themselves um, kind of at the heart. And then we have private sector partners, um, other civil society organizations, youth, um, youth serving organizations, policymakers, um, regional bodies, academic institutions. So really trying to take, a, take an approach that incorporates all of those key players. And we are starting with community-based research at the heart of that community of practice. So what that means is we've recruited groups of young women researchers in each of those countries. They are um, basically designing incredible research projects that are gonna highlight the issues and document best practices that they want to see, and then uh, share those to the community of practice and incorporate that into some collaborative learning. And so um, I think, Sorry, I'm gonna take a sip of water, actually. That's gonna dry. So I think what's most impactful for me about that model is that it's kind of flipping the, the power dynamics at play that usually happen. Uh, we hear a lot about co-creating with young women, bringing young women to the table, having their ideas kind of lead the, the discussion. But I think what this approach helps us to do is um, start with their ideas at the, at the very heart. So they are developing the questions that we want to answer. They have decided who are the key stakeholders. They are presenting these findings out to those stakeholders. And so what we're trying to do is model an approach that really does like walk the talk of, of youth leadership. Um, and I think, yeah, maybe I'll just wrap up sort of my, my explanation here with just emphasizing how important that enabling ecosystem is. Uh, we hear from young women in our programs time and time again, um, just how meaningful it can be for them to have those champions, those supporters, you know, family members, friends, siblings, parents, all of those kind of immediate supporters. And then on top of that, 
um, having spaces they can go to where they know they will be safe and, and heard um, and feel like they belong in them. So that's our goal with enabling ecosystems and, and um, it's sort of a work in progress, but I'm really happy to, to elaborate or answer any questions on that. And um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing from the rest of the speakers today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. In my own notes ahead of this, um, doing a bit of research on that, I have highlighted human-centered design approach. And I'm really interested to, to hear about what youth in these different countries that thought works and how, how they've interpreted this, uh, this application of the digital solution in their communities. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Now I'd, I'd like to introduce um, our third speaker, um, Taban Behin. And Taban, are you there? Taban I am. On yes. So um, Taban, welcome. Uh, Taban is a student in the Social Dimensions of Health PhD program at the University of Victoria. Her dissertation looks at the impact of digital tools on the consciousness of indigenous youth living in Snunemoch territory on Vancouver Island. Taban holds a Master of Science in Community Health Sciences with a focus on health research from the University of Calgary. Taban also holds a Bachelor of Arts in Development Studies with a focus on indigenous peoples of Canada from the University of Calgary. Taban's passion for dealing with health inequities through effective research and knowledge transfer methods has been forged through her travel and work in 26 countries, including living among Indigenous children and youth in Canada. Thanks very much, Taban. Go ahead. Thank you so much for having me. It's it's such an honor to join you um, in New York. I'm actually here in Vancouver. Um, actually at a conference for the BC First Nations Justice Council where 205 nations are gathered together and are reconceptualizing even their notions of justice. And yesterday we had an opportunity to celebrate um, International Women's Day and all throughout downtown Vancouver, there was a lot of uh, voicing of a need for change in the way that we consider the equality of women and men. So it's it's really a great pleasure to join you all. I wanted to just really just start off by looking at the questions that were posed this morning um, for us or for you this afternoon. One is, what does it mean for women and girls to be empowered users of technology? So very briefly, I think the notion of empowerment, it's in quotation marks, and I just wanted to address that idea of empowerment. Um, so really, the notion of empowerment, I'm joining you actually because I'm part of a Center for Digital Tools and Social Transformation, and I should share that a lot of these ideas that are pre I'm presenting to you come from this lab or the center that um, houses several researchers, actually, um, most of them, a majority of them are actually women, and we're doing research or conducting research that is community based and is focused around how um, we can actually look at four particular areas. So one is an area around individual and collective consciousness, how technology both shapes and is shaped by social, economic, political, and cultural forces. Two is this area around agency in technology adoption and use. So how do we take on more ownership in the decisions that we make in our use of technology and even in the design of technology? Um, third is actually this whole area of tech design, technology design, so specific tools that have become prevalent um, in our society. I think we don't realize how much values are intrinsic in those technologies. And so how do we evaluate evaluate those technologies and help to redesign them so that they're an extension of our values rather than going counter to our values as a society. Finally, um, the fourth area is around technology policy and regulation. So these are the four areas. And that one is a larger one that's really looking at how do we help governments to think about ways to protect um, the rights and the freedoms of women and children and those who are more vulnerable and also thinking about the way technologies are designed to actually help society. 
So just going back to this question of empowerment, I think this this is a really important question because within the concept of empowerment is the notion of power. And often power is possessed by, or we see power being possessed and associated with the values that somehow contra contradict the higher nature of the human being. So this idea that somehow power being used against someone or to manipulate others or to dominate, to rule, uh, or to subjugate, and this is what often happens, and we, we're all aware um, how how prevalent that is, especially in online mediums, for instance, like the internet or social media. So our aim, however, is to give way to a, a power of a different kind, and this is what the lab seeks to, to really foster, is a power that actually springs out of values that we all um, cherish, values such as love, justice, um, a search for knowledge and truth and understanding, um, really this idea of service and, and thinking about human, humanity and the needs of humanity, and then above all, actually humility and seeing how humility is actually a necessary condition for the process of empowerment. So then a next sort of notion I just wanted to present just very briefly is around consciousness, because in order for empowered users of technology to really, um, you know, take on that role, it, the question, this next question says, what qualities and capacities characterize an empowered user of technology? I think this idea of notions of consciousness is really important because we need to recognize the influences that are in our, in our communities and we need to dedicate our powers to building a new society. I think we can all agree that the society as it exists now, probably the reason why we are even gathered is that we really recognize the need for change in our society and a transformation so that we see where our values can be manifested, values related to, for instance, the equality of men and women. So this requires like a higher state of consciousness and, and really one that extends beyond just our material concerns, which unfortunately a majority of technologies today are designed for profit um, or for our, our material concerns. So this is something that is really of key um, interest to the lab that I represent and that we're working together. So I can give you just a couple of um, just very small examples of agency because there's this question, I think Eliza will expound on it further, the fourth question about how women and girls are taking an active role in shaping the development and use of technology. But I thought that maybe this third question of how are these capacities fostered in individuals and communities I can just share one really or two very brief examples that the lab that I'm part of is really seeking to foster through community engagement. So really seeing society as being composed of individuals and communities, as well as institutions. Um, one small modest project that just recently we carried out in Vancouver in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in all of Canada was where we brought together about 40 families who are part of actually thinking about the empowerment of young people already in their community. And they were discussing the role of technology and recognizing that we all play a role in how we utilize technology and how do we raise our consciousness about it. And so these discussions have been happening and it led to actually the young people realizing that they wanted to actually carry out surveys and further extend this conversation to other families and then share the results of what they're learning about consciousness, about the use of technology. And through that, you could see shifts that were happening in the habits of the young people as well as their families. It opened up a dialogue because oftentimes we find that you know, even some of the research that we had been carrying out, however small a scale it was, was already realizing, recognizing that how much technology use and some of the things that I just described earlier about how young people become sucked into or manipulated or, um, you know, they develop unhealthy habits or they become affected through their self-esteem, especially young women and young girls, as we know very well, that it actually had an impact on their family lives. So this research project both served to actually open a dialogue in within the context of the community, but also within the context of many different families. And you could see that this was helping to give shape to and shift, you know, however it was to the culture in the community. 
So there was there's other there's another little research project that's also being carried out in a couple of a few neighborhoods across um, BC, Vancouver Island, and Vancouver. And I can share more later, perhaps in the discussion. But I'm looking forward to hearing from others as well in relation to these questions. Thank you, Feban. I'm really excited to explore this idea of shifting community culture in the discussion. Um, I think that's a really that's a really important piece to think of. Where where do we want to go as, as a society with um, with the use of technology? Um, so thank you. I'd now like to introduce our third speaker, Lily Kunzimana. Lily serves as the representative of the Baha'i International Community's UN office in New York. <laughs> She's also a Canadian, by the way, from <laughs> Ottawa. <laughs> uh, her areas of work include youth development and peace and security. Lilian has a background researching and writing issues related to diversity and inclusion. Most recently, she was working as a community organizer, engaging youth and their families in educational programs designed to build their capacity to contribute to the well-being of their societies. Lilian has five years of experience working in policymaking in a number of diverse sectors. She has worked on government-funded development projects as well as, a public, as well as public affairs in the private sector. Lilian holds a master's in public and international affairs and a bachelor of social science specializing in African studies and political science. And thank you for the opportunity to be part of this fantastic panel. It's good to see other Canadians in New York City. Um, so in thinking about uh, the questions for today, one of them was um, on what does it mean for girls, for women and girls to be empowered in terms of technology? And this has already been touched upon by the other panelists. It was really interesting to hear um, how this is being explored in the context of communities uh, by the speaker. Um, and really when I was thinking about this, I think this question prompts us to think about what it means for somebody to be to be empowered in the first place. Um, and so a couple of questions came up when I was thinking about this. Um, has this individual been afforded uh, an opportunity by society to reach their full potential? Um, have they been able to lead uh, purposeful lives? Are they able to take ownership of processes for the betterment of society? And are their talents drawn on and their energies channeled toward the well-being of their communities? And lastly, are they rooted in flourishing communities with the lives of others or equally fulfilled? So in thinking about these questions and how to think about to be an empowered user, uh, user of technology, where does technology come in in this conversation, this consideration? So I think throughout um, the commission, we've been learning that technologies are um, they're, they're a tool and if informed by human, uh, humanity's collective values, these tools can help, uh, can help multitudes of individuals prosper in a myriad of ways. And we've heard wonderful examples as was shared by Megan on how this can be done. Um, and through the, the extension of women's participation, societal actors such as those in the private sector uh, as well as in the public sector can be exposed to the greater multiplicity of, of perspectives. Um, and this is really a prerequisite for building a future that is really responsive to the whole range of the human experience. Um, but I think this is not merely a question of better or increased access to financial resources. The, the societies that we're all yearning to create do not just happen as a natural consequence of more access to material resources or more access to money. Um, I think we all realize that if this was the case, the world's wealthiest nations would be paragons of equality, <coughs> justice, sustainability, and social cohesion. This is clearly not the case. This was unfortunately mentioned by the expense of the government. So, um, though there are very real concerns about access, rather well, access to the internet, um, on its own access um, to more material resources in the form of technological tools will not fix the issues of gender equality overnight. So, so throughout this commission, we have learned from the extensive research of a number of experts about how digital technologies have been utilized in many unfortunate cases of to exclude individuals, to harass, exploit, and repress. So this drives home the reality that digital technologies are not value neutral. So in recognition of this reality, um, here at the BIC, we reflected on what would be a fitting contribution to this year's commission on the status of women. 
uh, through the writing process of the statement that has been shared, uh, we grappled with a number of questions. Uh, we made an effort to understand the different act, what different actors in the space are saying and why they're <laughs> saying it. Um, we have, I think in many cases, we can observe that um, we have yet to determine alternative measures to societal progress, um, often GDP, um, the health of financial markets, and the competitive prices of goods determine the value of a given nation and its status in the world. And I think one of the more interesting aspects of the outcome and agenda process is that trying to come up with uh, other ways to be able to understand notions of progress. Um, and, but in this connection about kind of how we still continue to think about the value of a given nation, um, the consumption of digital tools driven by society's myopic uh, focus on profits can have a very deleterious effect. So for example, we know that uh, various forms of social bias and inequity often embedded in the design of digital technologies. This is something that Tafan uh, spoke to. Um, they, are, um, they are prompted, individuals are prompted uh, through algorithms to, algor algorithms, um, to like, continuously consume um, products online. Uh, this is despite uh, scientifically proven addiction concerns. And we see this in, in, in uh, the generation, younger generations in particular. So other concerns that we grappled with uh, include central questions our fellow colleagues are also trying to answer here within the UN system. So we know that many disparities still exist when it comes to achieving um, goal number five, and this is why we're, you know, this is the 67th mission of status, so we're still really grappling with this issue. Um, so for example, when it comes to rural women, um, we know that they, they face disproportionate levels of poverty, illiteracy, and unpaid care work um, and domestic workloads. Um, rural women also uh, face disproportionate vulnerability to environmental degradation and climate change and much more. So in considering the various aspects of um, how the, the various um, concerns of increasing access to, to technology, uh, member states also consider the multidimensional <coughs> challenges of this endeavor. Uh, such as technology facilitated gender, uh, gender based violence, which has been the central focus of many conversations here at the UN. So, these are just a few of the various questions and concerns that proliferate the conversations around the role of digital technologies. So, in trying to comprehend uh, what kind of contribution to make to the Commission, we also thought about how they would be understood. And part of this line of thinking is to consider what does it look like to have an objective of advancing an already rich conversation that's happening here in the UN system. So the statement became less about really what the BSC had to say and more about how we can contribute to a conversation about the innovation, um, about innovation and tech at the CSW. So really in reality, um, contributing to a discourse is part of a long process. Um, it is histor historically grounded. Um, it has a particular trajectory um, and really any contribution that anybody's here making at the UN has these aspects to it. So in reading the statement, there's a recognition that this particular moment in history is very <coughs> unique due to the ongoing processes around the outcome and agenda report and the global digital compact suggested by the Secretary General of the UN. There is room to explore how digital technology um, and, and innovation can be aligned with shared global values um, and uh, that the multitude of challenges require us to really come together and, and formulate a global framework to kind of to approach these challenges and to really to create a common vision for the type of societies we endeavor to create. So the BSC statement uh, was, was offered in this spirit of exploration uh, to prompt us all to think about how all societies make the most of, the most of this very unique uh, opportunity and to really reflect on the opportunities created for women in particular um, to flourish um, in all areas of human endeavor, but particularly of Syntech. So um, thank you so much, Andrea, for prompting us to, to think about um, the various themes in the statement, and I hope that you're all able to carry all of this, um, these reflections in the work that you're doing. Thank you. And now uh, our final panelist is uh, Eliza Rizal. Are you there, Eliza? Can you hear me? Great. Eliza is an illustrator and student in her final year of the 3D animation program at Humber College. She's actively involved in community building initiatives and works with youth at the grassroots level as an animator with the Junior Youth Empowerment Program. Eliza, thank you very much for being here today. And 
please go ahead. Um, I want to thank, first of all, um, I'm just so honored to be here and to hear so many other women talk about their experiences and their work with digitally empowering women. Um, and yeah, just, it's been so amazing to hear everything that's been shared. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Eliza, I'm a 3D animation student, um, and I've been working with youth ages 11 and above within a neighborhood setting. Um, and I just wanted to highlight some of the observations that I've noticed when working with youth and engaging with youth. And so to give context, I work in a grassroots initiative called the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program. And one of the foundational concepts we apply when working with youth is recognizing that there is more to mm -hmm. life than our material world. And by this, I mean the acquisition of material things or considerations that focus solely on one's own progress. Through this dimension, though this dimension of life is important, um, the program also considers true life to be the life of the spirit, which involves a dual purpose. So seeing oneself as being able to contribute to the lives of others and at the same time developing our own spiritual nature. By spiritual nature, I mean qualities that help us contribute to, to, for the betterment of the world concepts such as justice, generosity, patience, and cooperation. Navigating this dual purpose is very challenging, especially when the technologies that youth are engaging with can further emphasize to think about themselves only. Um, so really considered the self and only the self. Um, and so yeah, I would like to share some of the observations that I've had when working with youth, but also even for myself. Um, so one of the main things that I see a lot when youth engage with technology and media is wanting to escape their physical reality to enter another space to forget about everything, just because life can be very stressful. Um, and sometimes the pressures from peers or family members or from schools can be so anxiety driven that wanting to go to another realm where you, look at someone else's life, for example, a celebrity or an influencer, or even like movies or TV shows become much more attractive um, and less anxiety driven. Um, even for myself, I've really, I've noticed this when I was younger. Um, and in addition to that, um, youth are also very influenced by what they see from the media. So fashion, um, the different words that you use, like sometimes there's terms and words that if you use, you're automatically dated. Oh, you're from this generation, you're from that generation, um, your music tastes, and then also even political influences as well. Something I've noticed a lot is when you're on different forms of social media, there's just so much information that's coming at you. Um, and in one aspect, this is really nice because you get to learn about what's happening all around the world but sometimes it can be at the level of superficiality where it's very surface level information. So a lot of youth can share a lot about maybe what's happening a lot in the world, but when asked to dive deeper, it's, it kind of stops there. So being able to investigate further on what they're reading or what they're seeing, there's often a disconnect. Um, and the third one that I've seen um, is just wanting to belong to a community. Um, maybe in their real life, their interests and their hobbies, maybe not a lot of their peers um, have the same interests as they do, but then in the online world, you can meet hundreds of thousands of people who have similar interests as you do. And so there's like a, a, a wanting, a belonging to be part of a, a group identity, to not feel so alone. Um, and so these are the three main things that I've seen. There's many more, but um, instead of, maybe bringing up more um, insights where it's a little bit more negative. I wanted to share um, a really cool example that um, I've had to, exp that I experienced. Um, so I live in Brampton, Ontario, um, and Brampton um, has a large South Asian population. Um, and within that, there's a lot of uh, Punjabi people, so people from India. Um, and during the height of the pandemic, so in 2020, um, as with many other places, there was a lot of misinformation about the usage of vaccinations and vaccines. And um, within Brampton, a lot of the youth's families um, didn't know what to trust or would trust sources that were not credible. So to combat this, there was a team of us that really tried to think of how we can promote the education um, of true knowledge, specifically with vaccinations. 
And so we really relied on the different talents and capacities of um, the individuals within our neighborhood. So um, one of them like animated um, the video, one of them connected with their professor um, with a science background, there was a family doctor. And then, like I mentioned before, a large Punjabi population. So um, having the English translated into Punjabi was another really big aspect that we wanted to make sure like happened. Um, and thankfully the youth's parents arose um, and really like selflessly devoted themselves to translate um, the English to Punjabi. And other than the professor that um, what that was asked to be to help with the, the science aspect of things, we were all women. So it was like a team of women just like trying to get this video out. Um, and now it's on YouTube and all of that. Um, and after reflecting with one of the moms who was part of the translation process, she was saying that before it was really hard to find trusted sources, especially like with vaccinations. Um, so to now be part of a team that is actively thinking about that. Um, and now she herself is like, part of so that other families around her can have access to more information that is like accurate um, was very empowering for her um, and for all the other women as well that were involved. Um, so I hope that these brief descriptions of my observations have given some insight into the ways that technology can be a means of powerful influence, both uh, negative and positive. Um, and we've observed how technology can be empowering for the spiritual and physical health of youth um, and women as well. And so moving forward, um, we need to ask ourselves, like, how are we becoming increasingly more aware of the harm technology and media has on youth and women? And what are the ways in which we're using and promoting the use of technology and media as a means of spiritual upliftment? And then also, how can technology and media be effective mirrors through which a world where empowerment of youth, especially women, is reflected? Um, and these are questions that I don't necessarily have the right answers to, but I would love to explore um, more with the, the wonderful people here as well. So thank you. Thank you, Eliza. I, I really love that example you shared because I think it, it gave a really real example of what we talk about, you know, these words like co-design or youth engagement. I mean, it's a bit abstract, but what you described is really a solution that, that the young people in your neighborhood, the young women in your neighborhood came up with that no one else could have, could have done. It was really something so specific to your neighborhood that, uh, yeah, that it was really through those capacities that that you have that you were able to educate me. So, so thank you for sharing that example. Um, now I'd like to I'd like to shift to the broader discussion part of this um, of this event, and that I think that includes everyone who's here in person and online. If you really have a question that that you've been holding on to during this. Um, during this discussion, I encourage you to please write it down and pass it to Safira. And I'm thinking too, maybe in the last five minutes or so, we can also have it that we can have one or two remarks for people that maybe don't feel uh, like you want to write out your question. If you have something to say, we can also open the floor for that. Um, and so maybe just to, maybe just to start, uh, start this conversation off. We've, we've heard a lot about this word empowerment, and we've also seen an example of how it can really do a lot of good in, in society. And so I think I'd like, one question that I had is, given that there are these, these implicit values in the technologies that we use, I mean, Eliza mentioned some of the effects on youth can, can be apathy, but to some extent, I think, they affect all of us. Uh, I don't know who here is addicted to their cell phone, but <laughs> I think that's a that's a shared uh, a shared experience now. Uh, so, one question that I had was as we as we think of of solutions that involve tech, how are we 
how are we mitigating maybe some of these implicit values that in technology that do tend to steer us towards thinking of maybe within these existing models of profit or maybe over emphasis on self. Um, as, as Lily mentioned, even when we think of states, we haven't really escaped uh, notions of progress that are really tied up with economic success. Uh, so I'm curious to hear what you think. Uh, and anyone can respond, by the way, and, and feel free to ask each other questions. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll sure. answer first. Anyone else sure. can jump in after just to get the ball rolling. Um, I guess maybe when when you ask that question, one of the things that jumps into my mind is that uh, the youth that that I'm connected to through Dot, um, you know, they're really motivated by like a sense of purpose and meaning in their work. So they aren't you can and you can feel that energy from them and that commitment from them. Um, like they are trying to solve problems, massive problems in their communities, <laughs> global problems, climate change, like these kinds of huge pressing urgent issues facing them. And so um, I think it's really about honing and, and just, I guess, supporting and elevating what already is there, which is like an incredible drive to solve those challenges. Um, and for me, that goes beyond those pieces you've mentioned of like profit and 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 whatnot. Um, I think it is challenging though if we look at certain contexts where um, you know there's like limited opportunity. So so if you don't have food for the day, or if you can't afford to um, have shelter, or like those types of like very critical life giving elements, you know, um, I think it can be really challenging to sort of say, well, you need to find meaning in, in, in your work. So I think that we're, there's a, a ton of, you know, that I think that's a really complex challenge for these young people to navigate um, in, in the types of, of communities we work in. So maybe that's, I'll leave it there, but that's my initial reaction. I, I, I know you did, your work sounds amazing. I'm Nicole Ross from the Justina Mutelli Foundation. And um, the work that, what do you think is the most effective thing that you've implemented with your research and your program that has had uh, the fastest uh, return of an engagement from the youth in your program that you've been doing? Mm -hmm. so thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so, so the way we work is through cohorts. So I guess maybe for me, that's like the, the biggest immediate impact. Uh, and a few of the other, other panelists have mentioned that, that importance of that feeling of belonging or being a part of a community. And, and so because we work through that model, there's sort of like a built-in support system in the cohort. And, and you can see them collaborating and sort of going through the experience of the program together. Um, and we, we have, like I said, we focus on women, but we have men in that program as well. And so you can see men like learning alongside these amazing women and, and like being incredibly impressed by the work they're doing and, and becoming gender champions themselves in that program. And so maybe that's, that's what I pinpoint is that, that element of building that peer support and, and like championing each other's work. Um, in, in the cohort. So like mentoring, do you think mentoring and, and even if they're the same ages or multi-generational ages, just having that feeling that you can speak to this person that's facilitated more engagement and more activity for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think that like we all want to feel like we're a part of a, a group that understands us and, and are sort of working on, I think, shared, shared goals. And so um, I think that's a really important part of the motivation that, that we're trying to create. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation by everyone. And I'm also from Justin Amutal Foundation. I really like the concept of higher consciousness, which uh, Thabban was mentioning, that yes, we are heading towards the digital revolution, but where 
uh, what is the, I, I like your concept about community building uh, together because I work with uh, many charities which are led by Baha'is in the UK. Uh, and uh, I was wondering you know, how big a challenge is this? Because how many people are thinking about the cohesive spiritual concept of the community as a result of digital revolution, which you are you know, looking forward to for uh, gender you know, uh, balance and uh, to get girls motivated. I come from IT and telecoms and uh, you know, science background and I'm a STEM champion as well. So I was wondering, I always think about that, but how are you facing that challenge? Because consciousness, higher consciousness, towards technological you know, uh, transformation, how does that go together? I'm working on that, but how many people like your organizations are there? Do you find that many people with the same kind of mindset? How do you, you know, is that a big challenge to work towards high consciousness, you know, uh, Maybe. progression of digital, digitization of, you know, uh, um, maybe I'll direct that question to Taban actually, because I'm, I think it's tied to the work you're doing with community research. So what is the way that a community becomes more conscious around a certain principle? Sure. No, I'm happy to speak to a few things that we're seeing. And I think just building on what was shared earlier, I think this idea that when we see that knowledge is central to the work, so regardless of where anyone comes from, their background, if we believe that that's a universal right, everyone has a right to be part of the generation of knowledge, then it becomes something that actually we can then try and safeguard. So really with the research that we're doing, we're trying to also help young women feel that sense of ownership of this process um, of generating knowledge. And that's part of that process is becoming more conscious. So, you know, to speak to your question, one level of consciousness is even just looking at the impact of technology and digital devices, for instance, like social media, on the, on the psyche and the well-being of young women. So I come from a public health background and there's a lot of research even here at UBC or um, one of our universities in British Columbia that has done an extensive study over several years of thousands of young women and men. And they've seen how the impact of the use of social media with also a lack of community engagement, the two combined could actually lead to serious mental health um, challenges. So even just looking at the impact of like images and the way that they're modified and distorted so that young women think that this is the standard of beauty all the way to the way that violence against women and girls is portrayed in the media um, without even realizing it. And so part of it is just even raising this in discussions and in different groups, like Eliza mentioned, the Junior Youth Spiritual Empowerment Program, is even just having discussions about it. Have you noticed? Or even asking questions like, you know, even the little notification dot, when we see that digital tools are designed for distraction and addiction, then you think about like how, what are those mechanisms? And you can see the light bulb going off in the minds of young people and even in ourselves when we hear new insights, for instance, like, you know, how young people navigate um, you know, social media. So even the infinite, you know, sort of scrolling mechanism, they they talk about that or the algorithms that shape or, or change the way, or they talk when they're talking to their friends and they go on social media and there's an ad for the very thing they're talking about. So just helping them to realize that these sorts of things are happening and shaping the way that they're thinking. And then actually it's a really uphill battle, but it is an important battle. That's why we have this other area of research, which is around actually tech design. We do need to change the way technology is designed. We also need policies that safeguard the vulnerable. So I was thinking about the UN Convention on the Rights of Children and that Article 17 that talks about safe access to media. And it's a universal, it's a right of every child. So how do we ensure that? And how do governments also create policies that ensure that? So just to speak to your question about consciousness is that it's a very... <clears throat> Levels, and it really can even just begin with conversations that are fostered among groups of young people among and then fostered with their families and groups of families. This is how we're seeing that happen. 
Thanks very much. I mean, it, you're right, the mental health issue, because every time someone sees a message on Instagram, it's a <coughs> dopamine effect. And that's how, you know, they, they get hooked on it and uh, self gratification, which is uh, destroying and mental health issue. Uh, just to add on to the question before, you said you are also working with Calgary University. And I, uh, I was uh, in a uh, kind of an interfaith conference in the Centre of Oman, and there was a chaplain from there, I was a chaplain myself. I was wondering, how do you, uh, do you link with other chaplaincy when it comes to the spiritual uh, orientation of program? Do you do that? You know, if you don't mind, I think we'll cue your question, just because some have come in on paper. Okay. So if we have time at the end, we'll get okay. to the chaplaincy okay. question. That's okay, thanks. Uh, but we received a question that I think it's a two-part question, and I think the first part really Eliza would have insight on, and the second one maybe maybe to Beatrice. So we had a question that says, when you have a community-based group initiative, who is involved in running it? So Eliza, what is the structure, I guess, for, for your community-based initiative to, to help understand, or, or maybe even Megan, to help understand how is it that things are organized locally? And then the second part of the question asks, how does the research results or the product of your, your community initiative, how is it conveyed to local governments? Or perhaps it's like, how is it conveyed to even the federal government um, to actually have implementation at a broader level? So I would invite your... Yeah, I'm my question. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my question is, uh, is for Megan. Um, I'm Sudha Shivastava from United Kingdom. Thank you very much for this panel, uh, excellent information sharing. Uh, my question was, I like the um, uh, Megan's um, uh, example about ecosystem approach because that's how I think we progress further. And uh, my question is about the community-based group you talk about. Um, how the research and um, the best practices, the results you get though, with those groups uh, can wait for the government or local level um, power structures. How do, do they reflect? How frequently uh, do you get response? So this that's how it is twofold. So the first thing I, I want to ask about, how do you see these, who is running these groups. Um, so my, my um, intention asking this question is that I, if, if something somebody can replicate, which is working best, it's a best, best practice working in, in, in Canada, probably can work some other communities uh, at local level. So maybe if you can share some little bit more bits, how, how, how it has been done and uh, how, how it works, actually. But thank you very much for taking my question. Sure, I'll... Um try to answer briefly. And then um, I'd also love to, to hear uh, maybe from Eliza as well on the, um, because of her, you know, firsthand experience. But um, so I guess maybe I can illustrate with an example. Uh, maybe that would be the easiest way to speak to this question. So um, I mentioned that we're, we're implementing those communities of practice in several countries, but I'll just talk about what we're doing in Kenya specifically right now. So um, the way it worked is I have a, um, we have uh, focal points for gender or gender leads in each of our countries that we work in because we have offices there, country teams that do incredible work um, that are sort of my counterparts in country. And, um, and different members of the team with different skill sets all came together to design um, our approach and kind of what kind of learning content and what are the outcomes for the researchers themselves because the process of doing that kind of community-based research, I think is as important as that end product, at least for me it is, the idea of it being um, an empowering process that they're going through. And then uh, in Kenya, what that group of young women alongside those, those team members identified was a priority to focus specifically on safety. So, um, and, and that's because there are uh, the way we work is there are sort of um, like in-person facilities where you can train, access digital tools, internet, those types of spaces. Um, and often those are male dominated and they are always safe for young women. It, and it ranges from like the experience of what is not safe, but um, the reality is that they don't always feel comfortable going into those spaces. It's very limiting. 
So uh, those young researchers developed an idea of like what is safety for us as our starting point to see like where we want to get to. And then from there, developed a, a survey tool for each of those facilities or organizations to do like their own self-reflection on what are we doing? How are we showing up for these young women? Um, are we, do we have safe facilities? Do we have the right kinds of facilities they need? Um, and then working with those young women who are actually already sort of um, engaged with those different facilities already. So they already have a, a kind of a partnership. Um, they work alongside them to do that reflection and then I, and make some, some planning. And our goal, like the concrete kind of deliverable is um, some procedures or a change in the way they work. So we're hoping to see them actually take action on what they're hearing from those young women. But I think it's quite feasible. It's like a, an attainable change. It's, it's not like an overhaul of, of everything that they're doing. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll leave it there, but that's sort of like a, a concrete example of one country's approach, but it's different across all of those, those different contexts, depending on what those young women identified in those initial <laughs> stages. Thanks for the question. So maybe in the, in the remaining time we have, we can ask Eliza about how is it that you organize locally? And um, maybe then, um, Beatrice, if you have any closing remarks, you can uh, close this um, panel discussion. Go ahead, Elena. So can I get that question one more time, just so I'm understanding? I mean, the question was asking, um, so when you have community, a community-based group initiative, who's involved in running it? So similar to um, what we shared earlier, like it's different for every um, like city, but within Brampton, um, like everyone, children, um, youth, adults, grandparents, like we're all part of this process of thinking how we can contribute to the betterment of our neighborhood. Um, and so specifically, there are classes for children, there's classes for um, 11 to 14 year olds, and then also for 15 and older. So those are the three kind of um, areas that like, it's a bit more organized in that way. Um, but throughout all those groups, like, I think one essential aspect is that there's like true friendship, that there's never an idea of one who um, like there's no it's not like a teacher to student relationship, for example. Um, and sure, there are facilitators who can maybe guide those conversations and um, be there, but really it's just about experience. Maybe they have a bit more experience in like um, like facilitating these groups. But at the end of the day, like it's the youth that are bringing out these ideas for service for their community so if it means making like tea for their grandparents because in our parks especially in the summer there's just all these grandparents on these benches and they're always just chatting and so to connect with them the children and the youth were like maybe one way we can do that is to just like make tea for them because that's um, one of the social aspects with <laughs> um and specifically i guess for the video that was made like Another aspect that we look at is how do we facilitate and look at the talents and skills of each person, regardless of age. Um, and so naturally, because they're already part of these groups where we're already really good friends and we share our interests and like what we're passionate about, it was very easy to maybe, sorry, not maybe, it was very easy to see um, who could arise to serve in that capacity. Um, so it was a very natural um, process, I would say. Um, but yeah, I think, in terms of like organization and structure, like there is like a team um, that will meet um, on a weekly basis just to reflect on the different activities and different groups that are happening. Um, and it's always within like the mode of learning. So there's always, um, there's the planning stage and then there's the action and then reflection. And it's always these three um, that have been so essential to um, everything that we do. And sometimes it can be hard to remember that, especially when there are setbacks or obstacles. Um, but I think learning and operating in a learning mode has been something that's been really helpful. Um, that every, that, ev that anything that happens, there's always learning from that and how do we constantly strive and strive to get better and better. So, yeah. Thank you, Lyle. Do you have anything to add before we close out? Yes. Well, I was I was trying to get Andrea's attention to see if maybe I could add 
um, as you're as you're closing your remarks. I think many of us who are attending the CSW um, often have questions about the considerations that go um, into, that are taken into account as member states are thinking about their deliberations within the UN. So I just wonder like, if you might be able to give some insights as you're attending different events and listening to civil society, how that informs your process and, and how that's reflected in some of the decisions that we've been asking. So. Yes, well, I want to assure you that it's shaping on seriously our mind and it's very much you know, an opportunity for us to learn as well from all your areas of expertise and to see how we can reflect into the policy instruments that are going to be emerging of the discussion through the agreed conclusion, a broader reflection of, you know, some of the wisdom that we have heard. Um, you know, the technology or the digital space is pretty much, I heard, a, a, there are tools that we individually can engage with. But I think what came through very much in this conversation was the, the importance of community into uh, how we engage individually with that tool. Um, you know, community of practice, as Megan said, that's where we, where we um, uh, that are so important in your project. But also, Elisa, you talked about how you want to belong somewhere, to be part of something. And that's very much important into how they interact with the, um, the different tools. But also, I think, Tabanyu, uh, you reminded us of some of the, the study on you know, the impact of interaction of individual with the tool without the community support. And how can that be, I think, scary sometimes, or where it can lead and where it can bring. Um, but also, I think sometimes, we have to be mindful that some of the communities that are online or in the digital space are not always positive. So how can we put in place and make sure that we are creating consciously, I think as one of our, uh, 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 as you intervene, create these space that are, are safe and, and how we can correct, connect a little bit with our spiritual values in a sense of, of uh, that are so much driven driving our engagement with the world, um, but the reasons why we're here. And so how can we make sure that the tools we give ourselves are reflective of those values? And so I think that um, I heard really um, two important things, um, two, you know, two more important things, I would say. Um, and that's a reflection of yesterday that I think kind of transpire well the conversation today, the president of the General Assembly created a, a roundtable with a few uh, minister and senior officials. And there was a, a conversation around also, how do we shape those tools? How do we make them safe by design? How do we create those tools in a way that they will be safe for um, ourselves, our young our women, but also for our young girls to engage with? But also, um, and I think we talked about it early on, how do we um, educate ourselves to be using these tools um, so that, you know, it's not just, it, it's something we spend, as Canadians, we know 82% of Canadians within the, the first 30 minutes they wake up, they take this tool in their hands. So we know it's important. We know we live with it. We're connected to it. But do we actually know how to, um, how to use it and how can we we, you know, we can engage among ourselves, but also with young people uh, on whether some sort of the rules or the, the guidelines that we give ourselves, we are capable of teaching that to our young people within communications or social settings. That's also a social setting and how do we, you know, agree on the, some, some of the, the ways that we will engage in that space. So I really want to thank you so much for participating today and for uh, enabling this conversation because I think there's lots of food for thought um, that will be in all of your mind as we're moving forward and will also be in our minds as we go this afternoon in the negotiations for the second round, uh, a second reading of these agreed conclusion, hopefully for a successful outcome in 10 days. Thank you so much. So thank you very much to all of you who came here uh, this afternoon. Thank you to the panelists.
And thank you to the Baha'i International Community for hosting us. I, I personally found the, the conversation really fascinating. I could keep talking for another hour, but I know we all have uh, busy schedules. So uh, please, I invite you for those in the room, there's light refreshments in the corner. You can stay and, uh, and continue talking. We, we didn't get to all of the questions, so I hope you do get a chance to follow up with uh, whoever you wanted to speak to. And for those on Zoom, thank you very much for joining us as well. And uh, I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day.